Well, it's nice to be here. I'm going to be presenting on the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership, safeguarding wild plants for our future. And I hope that this is going to um, open a window on some of the wider work of Royal Botanic Gardens Q, and in particular the, the Millennium Seed Bank. And I'm looking forward to discussing some of the issues afterwards. I've got some um, personal thoughts which might lead to, to that discussion. So I'll give you a, a view of the structure of how I'm gonna how I'm gonna present today. I'll give a brief introduction to, to Q and a little bit about biodiversity and how we view plant diversity and the current threats. Then I'll look in more depth at seed banking and the way that we implement seed banking as a conservation tool through the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership. And I've got a number of examples from our Garfield Western Global Tree Seed Bank program that I would like to share. So focused on tree collection, tree conservation and use. And then, as I said, some, some um, potential priorities that we could discuss for the future. So you'll see this slide coming up um, a couple more times as we go through. I'm going to start with the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, two most well-known sites just for background, because not everyone's had the opportunity to, to come visit us. So Kew Gardens in London is a World Heritage Site, has um, some remarkable historical glass houses, collections, and that is where the majority of the plant scientists and fungal scientists are based. We also have a second substantial site in West Sussex, that is Wakehurst, which also has a, a heritage element but is predominantly known for its wild nature, wild character, and where we really specialize in demonstrating UK conservation integrated with the landscape. And you may be aware that we also have a third site in Madagascar that we're recognizing as a research site run by Q, where we can provide science research support to local partners and make a substantial difference to some of the major challenges um, for the both livelihoods and conservation threats that are, are occurring in Madagascar at the moment. So that is really our third site, as well as a range of partnerships that I'll describe in a little bit more detail as we, as we go along. So between those sites, we have over 350 scientists, so a substantial body of, of research um, and we have uh, strong relationships with government, mainly UK government, but also other links around the world that allow us to uh, make contacts and influence policies and debates and inform decision making in a range of different contexts. Overall, the Q um, organization can be traced back 260 years, but is moving fast in terms of addressing the, the current issues that we all face. So one thing that makes us unique are the extensive collections that we have. The science collections are remarkable and are massive. The herbarium alone has millions of dried pressed plant specimens. The center lower image here shows them in their green boxes which help them being sorted and moved around the different wings of the herbarium for safety and for convenience. But in addition to the herbarium collections which are primarily used for identifying plants and comparing their, their identity, we also have seed which I will come back to in more detail, large fungal collections, um, DNA and also non-living collections, our archives, famous library, um, illustrations, art, and microscope slides, a, a tremendous range. So if you're a scientist at Kew, you have access to this tremendous um, wealth of material on which to base your, your research. And it's 
it's named, it's curated, it's managed. And so it allows us to add quite a lot of impact in the partnerships as we, as we work around the world. Living collections, 30,000 plant species is hardly matched by, by any other botanic garden, I think. A tremendous range of well curated material. So that's Q and its sites and its uh, collections. I just want to say something about my own role because it's quite unusual. I don't have a typical research role um, and I'm focused on partnerships as the, the title um, shows. And through those partnerships, I work setting up projects, delivering and reporting, communicating results of projects that are really focused on these different bullet points preserving species, particularly those that are the most useful or under most threat, restoring habitats where we can, building capacity in partner institutions wherever there are, there are gaps, and also playing a, a significant role in developing best practice tools, methods, protocols for this kind of work, and sharing that in a myriad of, of workshops, conferences, uh, and, and uh, written and online resources. And it's a wonderful mix of work and it's sustained me for nearly three decades in this role. So I'm, I'm thrilled that it, it's continuing to, to be uh, of impact. And now I want to turn to biodiversity. And before we get to plant diversity, I just wanted to bring up the, the full definition of biodiversity from our um, biodiversity and ecosystem services colleagues. And I, you don't have to follow every piece of this, but it's important that we understand the different elements, the variability of both the living organisms themselves, their genes, species, individuals, communities, the variation at different levels in the second point there, and in addition, the interactions between them. So that even though our particular line of work is primarily focused on what you can do with seeds, and those seeds are representing individual plants. We're trying to take into account this broader context at all times so that we're protecting, supporting, and facilitating these interactions to, to, to take place in any community where we have a role in planning restoration projects. We're always thinking about the other elements of the community. This is my um, former woodland that I managed with hazel traditionally managed coppice trees and the typical bluebell understory, just reminding me of where some of these interactions can be can be seen so um, so clearly in the UK. So from biodiversity, we need to move fast to species and the plant species if you map them on uh, 10,000 kilometer square grids and then color up in red, those areas that have the greatest uh, richness, this is what the map looks like from Ness and University of Bonn. And as has been well recognized, there are some huge concentrations of plant diversity in the tropics and also in some um, regions that have unusual topography and have unusual climate and a lot of variation in the landscape. In addition to that, there are also pockets of endemic, so unique diversity held in islands like Hawaii. I'd include New Zealand in, in that as well, where that diversity is not maybe at the high thousands per square uh, meter, but is still of absolute um, essential value for recognition and protection and management. So we're always aware of these patterns of diversity. We're working to concentrate on areas that have diversity that needs to be protected, it's under threat, it's useful, and is endemic. And so if it's lost from one country, one administrative area, it potentially is lost to all of um, uh, human potential use. So I want to just look at some of the problems that we're facing in numbers, and I don't want to be too gloomy, but ITBES, who I've mentioned before, um, have just brought out some, some numbers that I'm comfortable 
um, using, even though it is rather dramatic. I mean, of the 8 million estimated animal and plant species on Earth, they are now estimating up to 1 million and are threatened with extinction, many quite imminently. And we know from estimates of the latest uh, ICN and other conservation assessments that approximately one in four plant species is now threatened with extinction. And actually that third bullet point indicates that that's not unusual for other um, groups of species as well. That is actually average for many um, species. And the number of invasive alien species is increasing in its impact and spread across our, our landscapes as well. So this represents a, a serious threat to, to some habitats. And you may be familiar with places where this is a, this is a major problem and very costly to resolve. Underlying those changes, um, just the top five in terms of their, their largest relative global impact, um, are changes in, in land use, direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, and these invasive alien species, um, and the, the problems that result. The image there is from a palm oil plantation in Dominican Republic, as it happens, but I could have taken that in a number of countries where the, the, the rapid conversion of land for that kind of system has, has resulted in a lot of impacts. Um, that probably weren't foreseen um, when permission was originally given. Well, we rely on plants. We rely on plant species for so many human uses that it gives an extra powerful um, reason for our, our conservation work when we're working with useful plants. Um, here we have just in the illustration, um, some, some approximate numbers of species that have been recognized for different types of human use. Um, and overall, from around 31,000 species with, with recognized use that Q published in 2016, that list is now extended to around 40,000. Um, and overall, if you take into account um, the, the, the contribution that plants are making to agriculture, then the economic value of them goes up to you know, 30, 40 trillion US dollars per, per year. I mean, this is a, a massive valuable resource and organizations like Q and our partners need to be able to identify where these species are, whether they're in trouble or not, and what potential use we can, we can make um, to alleviate poverty or improve society in, in whatever way. And so th that those knowledges um, are so, so important for us. So I've said something about diversity, the threats, the importance. Um, the, the obvious priority response is to protect and protect not just in, um, in by extracting individual samples of plants, but actually protect in nature reserves, national parks, um, wildlife refuges, whatever. And that still is absolutely vital for um, the, the conservation of global biodiversity and also has a fantastic value for, for at a local community level as this small nature reserve in, in my local region has in terms of allowing access to experience the wonders of, of biodiversity. But we know that nature reserves have their own problems. Not only are they very costly, there are risks that material can be lost. There are risks that pests, diseases, hurricanes, whatever, will come through and will, will have a, a really significant impact on some of these nature reserves. And that's before you factor in wildfires, climate change, which are increasingly a threat to some protected areas. So I quite liked the, the model that our, our UK um, Ecological Society has just published, showing in a, in a little schematic here, four key things that protected areas have to deliver. You can't just rely on the designation itself. That first 
point is that the area has to deliver in, for nature in the long term. It has to be protected with really um, correct legislative um, boundaries, um, infrastructure, everything required to, to keep it protected in the long term. Build resilience through having a diverse and um, uh, appropriate mix of species that are being um, maintained and held. The third point is about really trying to drive conservation outcomes by, by careful management and monitoring that takes resources. And the final column is quite correctly identifying the need to, to deliver these kind of protected areas inclusively with local stakeholders, local communities, landowners, um, and local municipal authorities. So if you can get those um, all working in concert, then a protected area can be very successful, but we can't rely on them. And even with all of this type of, of careful preparation, management thinking, protected areas are, have risks. So I want to show you now some of the ex situ approaches that we're um, working towards. First, one can recognize genetic resources in situ as the first stage. Um, this actually shows for European common ash, the Fraxinus excelsior, that has suffered a lot due to disease. It shows in the um, pale circles the in situ forest reserves that have been identified um, as protecting a particular set of um, diversity. And in the uh, red, you can also see, um, uh, I think this is Romania, um, there are also some ex situ, so harvested seed and other materials that are being held safely off sites to complement that. So, by working in combination through organizations like U4Gen um, that are facilitating this, it's possible to actually have a, a joined up approach to in situ reserves for particular species of. of economic value. That is still subject to risks and threats and costs. So now the ex situ thread. Um, I'm going to say more about seed banks um, in the rest of my talk, but just look at some of the other examples of off-site ex situ conservation that are within our, our sector and within our within our botanic garden and, and botanical research organization partnership networks. So the cryopreservation in liquid nitrogen is important for some what we call exceptional species that won't survive the normal seed bank drying. Um, in vitro, actually held in sterile culture is important for some growth tips if they can't be preserved and need to be maintained for, for use. Living collections such as botanic gardens remain important, although it is difficult to keep large numbers of individual um, plants. So it's difficult to have the, the diversity that we need reflected in living collections of that nature. Good for interpretation and occasional research, um, but that's not as comprehensive in terms of genetic diversity as some of the other options. Field gene banks, DNA and pollen banks also have important roles to play and directly support um, research, breeding, and identification, classification of, of, of plants as well. So our example of seed banking is, I think, one of the most cost effective of the ex situ uh, facilities that has been developed for plants. Um, if you've not been able to visit, then you can see the, the, the recognizable barrel vault and roofs of the Millennium Seed Bank at the Wakehurst site. And the storage of seed in cold store at minus 20 degrees Celsius is underneath the main um, floor level. And so the, the scientists and visitors work at one level, but the majority of the storage occurs underground where it's protected from, from shocks. And there is here now the figures show almost 100,000 seed collections of almost 40,000 species held. And this is a dynamic figure because we're continually drawing on material, testing viability, 
bringing new collections in. And so that figure is updated um, every, every quarter as collections are, are acquired and as they are used. But it's a very cost effective way of storing genetic diversity from a plant population so long as the seed is capable of dry cold storage under these conventional conditions and that is a, a conventional seed bank situation you might have noticed down in the bottom right we actually are fortunate to have uh, um, facilities for some of our scientific visitors to stay over um, which is very welcome and also for if we have visitors um, welcome to get into the interior display area of the building as well and see what's actually taking place on our seed collections so that's really the the seed banking um, setup within the ex situ response to biodiversity loss. And I want to go into a little bit more detail about how that works in practice. Um, using the MSP partnership and using a, a, a focus on um, also crop wild relatives, I'll use in a moment to um, give this a, a particular focus, which I think might be of interest to you. So the partnership's been running through two phases now since the Millennium Seed Bank was established in 2000. The first cohort of partners in the first decade are shown on the map in, in dark green. And then we've had expansions with the pale green in the last decade. And we're continually forming new relationships wherever there are partners with these kind of um, plant diversity interests that we can um, respond to and work with. So it's a pretty good open network of, of collaborators founded on bilateral cooperation, technology transfer and benefit sharing under the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was one of, one of the founding tenets of um, what we have been putting in place. Not all those partnerships are resourced actively under agreement at this point. We, we have a program of fundraising and project development, which continually um, shows that this map is, is liable to, to change as we go through our, our different programs of work. Central to the partnership, as I said, is technology transfer, but we have to have something to aim for. Um, with technology transfer. We're not just taking people on a journey um, with seed banking for conservation that we contract to the term seed conservation. We actually want to get to an end point and that end point is high quality collections that are satisfying users when samples are taken for research in one or two decades time. And so because of that, we have developed the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership Collections standards and by following the standards to the best ability and the best equipment that our, we and our partners have, we can minimise the chance that anyone is holding seed which is not going to be um, suitable for research restoration use in future. There are around 20 standards um, within this uh, 20 individual standards and they cover the whole seed conservation pathway. It's not always completely linear, but I'm going to um, just show you in this, this kind of chain um, a bit more depth from collecting seed to processing the storage, the monitoring of viability, and then all of the important data distribution of seed and management activities. Um, I'll summarize very quickly as well. So that's really the, the, the chain of events. Our Millennium Seed Bank manages to organize that very efficiently because it was set up bespoke for this particular purpose. Not all seed banks have that bespoke facility, but it's possible with um, the right kind of research support and the right um, investment in in equipment and facilities to carry out this, this kind of high quality operation in a range of different situations, gene banks, universities, um, research centers. 
So that collecting, let's just focus on that for the moment, pre-collecting, um, there are some very important tasks. Um, you're aware that I've been seed collecting for, for many years. We don't just arrive in the field and make collections. There's a whole process of analysis. What are the priorities? Which species do we need to be collecting from which region? And what time of year? May they be available? What vegetation, what habitats are they associated with? Um, how are we going to identify them? And here's an example of two sheets from a much larger collection target guide that our collaborating herbaria, in this case, um, the Q herbarium, have assembled for us with the best available information um, that will guide collectors as they get close to making collections um, with critical information to identify, well, locate, and then make collections. And this example is a Malus sylvestris, so it's one of the wild apples. And as it happens, this is a genetic resource because it's a relative of the domestic apple. And we, we wish to hold genetic material, seeds of these wild relatives in safe storage and make them available for, for research and for breeding. So this is an example of how we can invest using the resources and knowledge available in the collaborating herbaria with those pressed plant specimens and some literature and some expert knowledge to develop these kind of targeting tools. Uh, I want to say a bit more about why we want to collect um, crop wild relatives on this kind of scale, because I'm not sure that um, it's fully appreciated how significant they may be for future development of crops. Um, already, we, we know that there's a reliance on very costly and sometimes ecologically damaging herbicides, pesticides for many crops. They're also subject to significant yield reduction when there's droughts, floods, difficult weather that's not been predicted. And so we need crops that are resilient. We need options for um, the, the farming community to, to use as their situations change. And we can't rely on, on just one or two premium varieties that are high yielding under all the right conditions. Where are those novel functions going to come from? Well, many of them can, can be found in our wild relatives. This is where the, the stresses of the different pest diseases in the environment have been already responded to by wild plants. And so the neighboring species, often in the same botanical genus, um, are, are, are the place to, to start. And we have to have those banked, as, as we say here, untapped diversity, which can actually have adaptive value. And as we started our Crop War Relatives recent program, um, around 30% of the species recognized as Crop War Relatives were, were not available in gene banks and really needed collecting and bringing in for, for research. And we also found that a significant number, uh, maybe 20%, were under threat themselves. And you will see here that the the, the range of um, kind of crops that we've been working on to um, include in this major program, the Adapting Agriculture to Climate Change project, which um, has benefited from a, a massive 50 million US dollar grant from the Norwegian government and has been really helpful in providing material that's now going out to pre-breeders. You can't use this wild material immediately in a breeding program because it's a bit like having a wolf at home um, rather than a dog at home. Um, you have to make sure that the, the right valuable parts of these wild relatives are prepared and organized, identified, classified, and provided for the, um, for the plant breeders to make full use. So we're very pleased with these partnerships, including the Crop Trust, who manage the, the, that program, 
what impact we're uh, hoping to have on future um, crop development. It's just a, an indication of the countries that participated in that crop world relative program. Um, and there were restrictions to work under the Annex 1 crops of the International Treaty on um, Plants for Food and Agriculture. And so not all countries were eligible to, to work in that, but we were really thrilled to have so many new players um, come in and want to work with us. So that's just an example of how we can focus some of our work around a really relevant program with priority species in mind. Okay, so I want to get back onto that chain of actions um, and say something about collecting. Um, I do a lot of collecting, I love field work, and um, this is a, a, a relatively uh, recent field trip right up to the high altitude of, of southern Peru, 4,500 meters, looking for the plants that are the most resilient to those extreme conditions. Um, in that case, focused on medicinal plants, but the, the biology of hunting them down, collecting them, and doing quality tests on them up in the field um, is, is similar for the species we're working on. You see in the left, one way that we just assess the likely quality of seed, even at flowering stage, as the, the um, flower is pollinated, fertilized, and we can see the very first signs of seed formation. We'll occasionally even section the, the, the flowers through in order to understand what the biology um, is, is predicting for development of those seeds. The important step in our chain of conservation when we have seed collections from across typically 50 individual plants across maybe a kilometre of landscape. So there's a lot of work in the collecting phase. But the, the most important next thing is to dry those seed collections. And I've shown on the left the, the situation in country on a trip where there's a secure area to spread material out, get rid of any excess moisture. Moisture is our enemy at this point. And it, it enables us to conserve the material during the trip and have it in secure bags, packets, um, ready for delivery to the gene bank. So on the right, you see the, the reception dry room at the Millennium Seed Bank. It's quite large by gene bank standards, but we have a lot of space there to move new material in if the results of a trip come in that could fill one or two stacks of crates that you can see in the image. And this is running at around 15% relative humidity. So the, the, the conditions are pretty similar to a, a, a long distance flight after several hours where the that, that air has been um, reduced right down and the moisture is extracted from the seeds. It immediately slows the aging process. And it's the first stage in preparing those um, seeds in that seed collection um, for storage. We've had to innovate in order to provide the best possible facilities for a whole range of new partners. And so I'm showing you here, one thing we've developed um, for seed banking equipment that we've deployed in, in these large hermetically sealed blue drums. I think um, some people may recognize them for storage of or tr transport of fruit juice well they're very effective as containers to safely get our materials into country and in the large foil bags on the floor of our um, room there you'll see uh, where we have dried pre-dried silica gel which is being used as, a, as an agent for the drying of seed so that's also shipped by us to partners that have requested this kind of um, practical, inexpensive system for drying their seed collections and then moving to store them in a, in a laboratory freezer 
Um, and you'll see a whole range of other equipment that's that's packaged up as part of these these programs. It means that there's no obstacle to enter this kind of seat banking program if you've got space and the training to run silica gel drying to to place your collections in a deep freeze at the end of the, the, the um, conservation uh, process, then this actually opens up the, the technique for community groups, for um, smaller botanic gardens, for university departments to, to get on and develop this and have material available that's high quality to use in their own work if they need. In our case, we have favoured these glass jars for the long term conservation step in most cases. Um, we recognise that some seeds may prefer to be in the dark. That's recent research. And so actually we're converging now on what some banks for a long time have been using, which are these aluminium foil envelopes you see down in the, the bottom image. We've always recommended that for areas of, sort of earthquake risk, because that's obviously going to be better after a, a, an impact. But I think you'll, you'll find the aluminium foil in greater use across, across gene banks in the long term. They have to be hermetically sealed with a heat sealer, but that is uh, not difficult to, to, to purchase and use safely and very effective for seed conservation. And what we're trying to achieve with these high quality containers is no moisture entering. Um, and so we may pop indicator sachets in there that give us a visual reference to the amount of water that's um, in the atmosphere and warn us if there's a problem. And with this combination of the dry cold storage, the majority of our sea collections are going to um, easily pass 50 years high quality storage and some will go more than 100 or, or way beyond in storage. So that's buying us multiple decades of time for the species to be better understood, used, researched, and if necessary, recollected or re, um, regrown. Uh, this is a view into the storage in the MSB and the, the cauldron doors are thrown open, hopefully not for very long, but um, you can see the, the level of um, detail on the construction there. We want to confirm that our seeds are safe and we have here viability testing, uh, germination testing, and that's really the only certain way to know that your seeds are, are going to um, be suitable for, for use in research projects. Um, and we will retest every 10 years. And I've got one example of a particular nice story of seed that has been supplied from the MSB. The, um, the, the request is often for relatives of species of interest, given that we have such a large diversity. So this example down the bottom shows the Japanese knotweed plant and our research partner, Kabi, were keen to test a biological control agent, not just on the Japanese knotweed, they were pretty sure it was already going to be effective there, but was it also going to um, consume the wild relatives um, of, of the Japanese knotweed? And so there's an enormous economic benefit if you can provide from your seed bank quality named material of relatives for that kind of study. And um, the LSE has come up with an extraordinary high figure. We'd love to be doing more of that work. I'm going to pass over the agricultural sector for the moment and tell you something about the other global seed bank you may have heard about, which is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Quite rightly, it has a very high public profile. This is the reserve backup deposit for agricultural programs around the world that choose to send samples of their seed um, for safe storage. Um, it is what we would call black box. So there's no particular facility there for adding any sort of research um, 
to the collections, but they're absolutely safe. And we're happy to include the, uh, the, the vault within our broader partnerships. And we have, um, in, a, in a, a sense, divided up the, the, the global seed banking remit um, between us, where we're holding so many of the wild species and the, the, the seed vault here is holding the majority of backup crop collections. Of course, there's many other banks around the world, but just for, um, for global recognition, that's the way we like to indicate. And finally, we're disseminating data all the time. This is a particular tool that we use for, for uh, our partners. Um, we call this the MSB Data Warehouse, and it's in another phase of development at the moment. It's just an example where we have the ability to share collections, information from our seed bank to our partners. I'm not going to go into to show you that in any great depth, but it allows also us to hold copies of partner data and compare how's our collection compared to their collection doing and identify any particular problems or, or risks. So that's the, the, the seed banking um, through from collecting through to banking and the dissemination. I hope I have time to give you some tree seed bank examples because they are um, related to challenges and in particular, the one I'm going to start with is a climate change threat. This is the Brewer spruce that some of you will know. Um, it is actually, as a horticultural and arboretum tree, relatively well known in many botanic gardens, but the wild material is in the long term threatened by climate change. So this this spruce um, was collected by a team that I was working with um, US Forest Service and Kew and two other UK Botanic Gardens cooperated on this. And we really wanted to get this material, which is on the north slopes of key mountains um, between Oregon and California into seed banks for the long term and potentially to be making that material available for um, what we would call translocations or migrations in the long term. So there's evidence that I was there and boy were we lucky with the conditions that day. And the Brewer spruce is in the background. We like to confirm by really detailed inspection that the seed is good in the different cones. Um, and as I said, we're trying to capture as much genetic diversity as possible. That means large collections. So with a team of over 10 tree climbers working on this population, we managed to collect a um, substantial amount of seed, always keeping to 20% as the maximum harvest, and also a set of the press plant specimens. Not all of those specimens in the image come from the Brewer spruce, I hasten to add, but um, two sets of them will be. And just to indicate geographically how this stands, we have on the map in red, the, the mountain tops and the hilltops where it has been recognized, but the climate change projections are very serious. And so within 30 to 50 years, the environment for this relict of glacial origin um, here on the Oregon, California region will be um, several hundred kilometers further away. I, I believe British Columbia, Canada is the projection. So it's an example where this, this species is not going to move naturally. It's best to have it in healthy populations in, in situ and also good seed samples held ex situ while we work through, are we going to do something um, significant um, in order to try and make space for this, this beautiful species somewhere else. So that's a an example with one species from the US. I wanted to mention a couple of others that are, have also come up within the Global Tree Seed Bank project. Madagascar, you know, we have a lot of work at the moment, and we've pulled out here three species of threatened plants that have been um, sampled by the, the, the Malagasy team, 
and seed banked. The Dalbergia is a relative of the rosewood. The Fetida is a, is a potential logging um, threatened tree and the Abrahamia um, has problems at the level of its dry forest habitat that's being transformed. So these are examples that, of species that have been seed banked within Madagascar. People are always asking for specific examples and there are three. And I'm closely involved in our Mexico program also under the Global Tree Seed Bank project. And here we have two examples, a Sphinga and an Amphipterygium, um, which have been seed banked. And you'll see on the left a series of maps. That obviously, at this scale, you're, you're not going to be able to get into the detail. But I wanted you to look for some of the orange and red patches in the five large scale maps. And those show concentrations of tree species diversity. This is where the majority of species diversity is held, uh, according to our analysis and using herbarium data. So as part of the program, we haven't just been collecting, we've also been looking for these patterns of diversity. And Veracruz on the east coast and Chiapas in the south have come out as significant high diversity areas that need a response from us. And in fact, in Veracruz, we're very active um, trying to get through from the collecting and the research stage right through to the nursery reforestation phase, which is starting right now. And we haven't ignored the UK. Uh, in the UK, we have a, a substantial tree seed project that has banked millions of seed from substantially all of our native trees and shrubs. Now I've mentioned ash before in that forest genetic resources map of Europe. Well, ash has been really um, impacted by the ash dieback um, fungus, which is an invasive fungus, which is um, causing widespread dieback of our ash. So our team have been involved in surveys of the remaining ash, looking for any evidence that um, ash trees may be resistant or, as we say, reduced susceptibility to this particular pathogen. And to try and introduce new elements, we've been taking vegetative cuttings of ash to try and bring uh, vegetative material in as one way to test and respond to this, um, this established pest now, which is really affecting the country. We do hold, by the way, some threatened ash seed samples which were duplicated from the Canadian Forest um, Seed Bank. And so they're held in the MSB, uh, which is a good way that seed banks cooperate to reduce the chance of, of um, critical loss. And because we can get very involved in the higher level policy um, development in the UK, I wanted to just flag up that forest genetic resources are being attended to within the UK and there is government and industry response here to try and save what we have and manage what we have. And also at global level, the botanic garden sector has brought together peers to respond to this massive demand for trees for reforestation at the moment. And we've been concerned that a lot of the efforts that were going in were not based on science and not informed sufficiently by the need to preserve precious habitats and provide reforested um, material of high genetic diversity that's native. So you might have heard of the 10 golden rules for reforestation that was published in 2020. Q hosted um, a significant conference to also develop the thinking that's led to the uh, 10 golden rules, basically protecting what you have, um, cooperating, thinking through strategies very carefully, and um, you will easily find this. It's an open access journal, uh, open access paper, if you look for this online. But it's common sense to the ecologists working in this sector, and it's an important message um, to all the other players in the sector. Those 10 golden rules look rather dry. So I just took the liberty of adding the, the kind of schematic image from the same paper 
you know, what would this look like in practice? There's the protected native forest on the hill on the right. There's the restored forest with people actually harvesting and working in it on the left and a whole range of natural um, resource activities that could support that kind of approach. So society has a choice. It can rush to plant trees of inappropriate types desperately to try and suck carbon out of the air, or it can do things in a careful way with science, information, and lined up policy and funding and create a, a, a better place. That is our hope. I'm going to finish in a moment. Um, I just want to acknowledge, particularly for this presentation, where material and examples have, have come, um, the great help over the years from um, our Mexican partners, our US partners, um, also Chile, where we have great collaboration, and Global Crop Diversity Trust, who were our partners in the Crop World Relatives Program I mentioned. Two funders, the Gulf of Western Foundation and the People's Postcode Lottery, and um, also several colleagues that have helped with, with material. So if you permit me, I'd like to just offer a couple of future priorities slides, which first focus on what I believe are the three massive biodiversity linked challenges that we have um, to avoid this dangerous climate change, to halt and reverse the dramatic biodiversity loss that we're suffering, while also at the same time meeting food and other needs of a growing global human population. You can't solve any one of those without also substantially solving the other two. And we know we're in a complex um, situation here and our particular expertise is going to be used in responding to that second biodiversity loss challenge, but we try and integrate as far as we can livelihoods and climate change resilience into our program so that we're responding in a way to, to, to those challenges simultaneously. And we think that's an important message. And so our sector, the, the, the plant science, botanic garden, seed bank sector, what should we be focusing right now? We all have strategies, we all have plans, we all have partnerships. I would want to focus on identifying those most important plant areas worldwide. There is still work to be done. Um, Q and partners have added a lot of useful work in the tropics to the network of important plant areas, but there's more to be done. We need to continue to strengthen ex situ protection of species that are either threatened or useful. We've got to inform policies that don't just maintain the current system, but transform um, through robust research. And finally, mobilizing all of the expertise, the plants, the, the, the germplasm and communities that wish to have access to this material for nature recovery. And I've put up uh, an image there of a restored prairie and savanna in Illinois, which is a delight um, to all visitors, and also an, a, an image there with the global biodiversity standard, which is one way that the 10 golden rules are now moving from a, a scientific idea into an actual tool that can be used to improve the standards of, of practice in reforestation. So thank you for listening, and I'll be very happy to take questions and um, hope that that's been of great interest. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. Uh, I've been having a little bit of connectivity uh, interruption, so my introduction to you was a little bit abbreviated. My apologies. Um, one of the things that struck me was that this is a very intensive use of electricity in order to preserve all of these different seeds. What sort of uh, backup systems do you have to prevent the failure of your storage uh, facilities. Okay, the first part of your question assumes that we're using a lot of power in order to, to maintain the collections. And I think actually we've come to some quite 
sustainable systems. I believe that we now have CO2 based um, coolants, which are the ultimate generation. So even to maintain the collections um, with the, the, the systems, we are now running very effective. Plus we have solar panels, PV on our roof to, to make a contribution to that, um, that demand. In terms of the backup, um, we have, on, like most um, science collection facilities, we have backup generators, which could um, tide us over for um, a number of hours or, or a day or so. And we have big connection points where we could actually bring heavier equipment um, plant in order to meet the needs in a longer term basis if um, the standard um, machinery is, is out of action. So I think we have it covered. Plus, being underground, there's a huge thermal mass um, at minus 20. The, inst the instructions would be to staff, don't go in uh, to those cold rooms unnecessarily if we are trying to um, conserve power for a particular crisis. So I think we've got it covered, but thanks for the question. OK, and then uh, Dave Doherty is going to ask a question, and then Ted Manning. Hi, very interesting talk, thank you. Um, it occurred to me while you were talking that if you think of crops as being in the middle, the, um, the wild relatives being on the right, there is actually something on the left. And I'm wondering the extent to which you or other facilities are storing genetically modified organisms. Uh, we are not. Um, we have no need to. Um, our focus, our um, expertise is on the, the natural um, evolved diversity that's out there. So unless there's some particular laboratory need short term for some kind of um, modified material, which is not my area of work, um, uh, there, is, there is no genetically modified material in the main collection. A kind of a follow-up, to what extent are you storing the genetic material of crops that have largely now become genetically modified, for example, corn and soybeans, and there are many others. Are you storing the wild types? Um, we would be one of the places to go if you wanted to, to get hold of the wild relatives, yes. So uh, I'm trying to think of, I mean, I'm not an expert in crop development nor um, genetic modification, because as I said, it's not basically what we do. But I know that for the banana breeders, for example, we now hold the seeded wild bananas um, from Vietnam and some of the, the other parts of its distribution. So those are available to breeders if they wish to come and access them and it's up to them whether they're going to get genetic modification into their um, breeding programs that's that's not what we do yeah great thank you okay and uh, just before uh, ted has his question i had a thought about uh, how many different seed banks are there around the world you mentioned that there were quite a few i know of three but not many and then Ted's going to ask sort of a parallel question. Do you want to ask it now? And then uh, Michael can sort of ponder both at the same time, Ted. Well, I, I just, uh, I have a follow-up question, by the way, which I think is better than the one I've got now. But uh, uh, certainly if he can clarify uh, what you have said, do we have any in Canada and who is the contact here? Uh, is it government or is it someone else uh, who is part of this process? Okay, let's start on the, the, the big picture first. Um, I think in the presentation you'll have seen the, the figure of around 1,700 crop gene banks that are recognized and the Svalbard facility acts as a potential backup to them. So that is um, a, a consequence of most countries having substantial efforts in plant breeding crop development and want to hold the, the resources critical to, to their nation. Um, wild species seed banks, um, we can probably say um, many, many dozen, but I don't think there are a hundred 
um, that are operating at any great um, scale. But there are lots of small, small facilities because it's very much a research driven activity. The wild species work requires substantial research effort. It's, it's really opened up with small facilities in a number of research institutes. So um, I can't give you a complete number, but I think it's quite a dynamic field. In Canada, I'm aware of the big crop bank, which I think is in Saskatoon, uh, which is government run, and that is focused on crops. And also the, uh, the, the facility, um, which uh, I referred to where we'd taken um, the duplicate collections of ash. So that is within Natural Resources Canada. Um, I think it is called the, um, the, the National Tree Seed Centre, but um, forgive me if that's not the current up-to-date name for it, but it's um, running very, very effectively. So you've got two substantial facilities, and in addition, there, there will be private companies, NGOs, um, and other organizations holding species of interest. Now, can I add my follow-up? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, as you'll see behind me in the thing, I, it's a botanical garden, that one from Sri Lanka, and I am a fanatic. I visit them all around the world. Uh, but the problem uh, I want to raise is right now, the one behind me is probably being destroyed. The one I have a picture of in Ukraine, I know is being destroyed. Uh, I've worked in parts of China where they have essentially been replacing most of the natural habitat with uh, supposedly reforestation with a green wall. So uh, do you have any sort of emergency reaction capacity to sort of go in there and at the very least make sure we have the ability to restore? It, that, that response to a critical loss mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why this seed, these seed banking networks exist. Yeah. So I could take that at two levels. There's loss of the habitat and the natural diversity where you would hope that the, the national facilities and the regional facilities hold the critical species that are needed for a reforestation or a restoration effort. Um, and then it, it's also possible that the national facility itself is destroyed and so you've lost the exit to collection and you might have seen in the crop well relative slide that i put up um some press footage i think that was from the ikada international facility that was in syria that was overrun um during the problems and most of the collection and um substantially all the infrastructure was damaged and so the there have been duplicates held elsewhere in the network and ICADA continues to work with duplicates of the same collections but in another site so the the work goes on so in in both ways I think there is resilience in holding duplicate collections and publishing what you have to your network thank you very much I'm glad you're in the insurance business we, we are <laughs> art uh, go ahead and th this is uh, kind of related, of course, because we're uh, we're very much aware that climate change is uh, actually encouraging migration of insects, and plants, animals. Um, this has been happening and and is planned to or is expected to accelerate as climate change itself becomes uh, deeper. And this uh, leads me to ask the question, how in the world do you keep track um, of a species which has, has migrated? What is the, um, how, how do you keep possible, you know, records on, on uh, uh, where this species might have migrated to? Okay, well, the world needs more botanists. <laughs> and it particularly needs more field botanists who are willing to do reliable quality monitoring and i'll take the opportunity to say that last saturday i joined our local community botanical recording society who do exactly this kind of monitoring in a hectare tetrad 
template across the UK for the love of it, but also knowing that every record that they submit goes through to our various record centres and appears on the, the, the National Plant Atlas when it's re revised every year. And so that's that's the way we track what appeared to be a marginal species just in one part of the country that within 10 years is now actually across half the UK and we should pay much more attention to it. Plus, there's, I should just mention there's a, that there are a number of higher risk taxa that come up under what we call horizon scanning, where we're looking at what other countries are registering as their threats and taking particular interest to track them before they become invasive. Uh, and uh, I guess really the it's the, the record keep, keeping part, I mean, to even keep track of all that means you've got a very extensive database and, and you must have, um, uh, you know, uh, a substantial crew of people who, who are keeping that database uh, up to date. Well, thankfully, the, the connections that we're making through some of the new tools like iNaturalist, um, iRecord, which can be used by individual recorders, will send records in, after they've been double checked for authentication that it is almost certainly the species they think it is, will go straight up to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility with a research grade status, and that's immediately available um, to the wider community. So there's an enormous aggregation of data um, by um, tools such as GBIF, but it means that it's not all 100% um, the same quality. So any researcher that wants to use that enormous up-to-date data set from records contributed around the world has to always go through a substantial cleaning stage. It's always the first thing. You get access to your material, you download it, and then you have to do substantial cleaning. But the, the good news is we don't all have to just multiply up the number of database staff we have. We do need them and we need them to be good, but we need them to make connections that ensure that the data will, will feed through into bigger national and global schemes. Thank you. Excellent answer. I hadn't thought of the immediate connection for iNaturalist and other ID programs that go straight to you. Interesting. John Legg. Hi. I think, uh, Michael, you may have uh, answered part of the question by referring to partnerships, but uh, from, I think it was uh, Phil's original question, the question of uh, uh, planning for possible power outages and so on, do you also use uh, duplication? In other words, now, what I'm thinking about here is a, uh, a government, which you did refer to, uh, Norway, which is, I don't want to exaggerate it, but they're quite wealthy. So uh, it seems to me that duplication in some cases would be a very safe way to proceed. Uh, one could say, well, that's rather excessive to have uh, part of your seed bank collection uh, duplicated uh, in in Norway, but I, I had read before that there was a uh, rather large, important uh, seed bank over there. Do you do you use, other than other than the partnerships? Do you use duplication as well as a uh, a measure against uh, unplanned losses in future? Well, I can, I can confirm that duplication is essential and it's at the heart of the partnerships. And occasionally we step outside those standard partnerships if the partnerships are with academic bodies that want the job to be done but don't want the cost and um, hassle of having their own working seed bank with all of the overheads. We may request the government-run national crop facility 
to hold the wild species duplicate samples on, on their behalf and they're held under very adequate conditions but you in in most cases we wouldn't expect the crop gene banks with their main remit being agricultural material to take the same kind of interest in maximizing germination with all sorts of unusual um, conditions having to be met for these wild species which um, we would for example but in terms of the safe storage there are there are several examples like that but where we can it's part of the partnership um, and the, the the leading model that we have is that the in-country partner holds the collections we hold a duplicate in the UK and in the UK for UK source material we have to find a duplicate location um, so that we're not the the only organization holding that material but duplication is good it's relatively inexpensive the data is passed over the collection is is separated and results can be compared research can carry out at both um, can be carried out at both sites Oh, very wise. Thank you. Okay, Jean Doherty has something to add too. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. And as a former curator of a very large national collection, all of the things that you were talking about are things that I've encountered myself. However, um, my question was relating to how information and how specimens actually get into your collection. And you've alluded to that using the I um, naturalist people out in the field themselves, but but how do the actual seed specimens get into the collection? You've also said that individual countries will hold their own specimen collections, but how do we how do we get them into those collections if we are interested? Okay, um, I'll take the, the general botanical information flow, um, just to clarify there, that is a recording effort with botanical observations and will flow through these various pathways and that's where iNaturalist comes in. That wouldn't be adequate for our seed banking um, uh, uh, programs where we need much tighter control on who is going to be targeting which species, um, do they have permission and if so from who, um, how is that seed being collected, is it being duplicated with us and um, all the all the agreements have to, to flow all the way through so that everyone is um, aware of the permissions that attach to that material because we're, we're um, doing this at the invitation of um, our host countries and the information that goes alongside that will have been agreed right up front at the beginning of those projects and those agreements will have templates uh, made available and the current main way that we acquire the data with the collection is through an Excel template, which has dozens of fields, all standard with some pull down menus for various options that we've agreed. And that is inserted into our um, database um, that we, in fact, we're, we're renovating that at the moment, but it, it can acquire quite quite simply that data from, from spreadsheets. And in most cases, that's that's very effective. We're not doing direct data flow from field through the ether to the database at this point. It takes maybe two or three hours to make a decent um, seed collection in the field, and it maybe only takes 10 or 15 minutes to get all the data down on um, a paper or a laptop there. So we, we focus on quality and breadth of data and then at the end of the trip, we'll um, send that through um, as, as, a, as a spreadsheet file in most cases. Does that answer? It does, with, it does with respect to the data and the data management, it's which is seed. absolutely critical. But what about the seeds themselves? If you've got, if okay. you've got research programs in other parts of the world, mm -hmm. how does that come in? Okay, so if it's a local trip such as UK, our staff will bring that directly back to the seed bank and it's essentially fresh material that needs processing and cleaning directly by us. But in most of our partnerships, we build in um, the skills, the equipment, the sieves, the, the, the drying equipment so that the partners can do substantially the entire operation. 
and then every few months it could be six months after the trip that we, we would expect those collections to be dried cleaned and labeled and ready for duplication either to our facility or to their other second duplicate facility in country and they'll be sent in breathable bags to avoid any kind of condensation getting in in them or they'll be sent dry in those aluminium foil sealed envelopes and the protocol is is pretty similar at reception at the the arriving gene bank plant health is a significant consideration getting our material inspected and certified free of all known pests and diseases is increasingly challenging um, with our um, programs not having the same basis as most of the crop programs that um, drive the, the plant health system so that's that's becoming more and more challenging but equally we know that that's a major risk to the ecology around the world so we're having to respond to that Thank you very much. That was a very thorough answer, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, back to GMOs from Rick Carpenter. You're muted, Rick. Really appreciate this uh, talk, Michael, and uh, I, I work as a volunteer at our um, Arboretum here in Ottawa, and I visited Wakehurst and Kew, and, uh, but you'll right. see from my question that I'm not a scientist. Um, I can understand how monocultures um, are a threat to biodiversity, but are the genetically modified seeds in themselves a danger? Right, that's potentially got a couple of risk areas that are worth just mentioning. Again, I'm not a specialist in this area, but most of my personal concerns around the use of GMOs is on the broader effects it has on trade, market access, livelihoods, poor income countries, and what they may or may not be able to do from one season to another with their harvests. But there are some risks of concern and i think the one that i would flag up is that um depending on the uh, the, the system under which a gmo has been produced there is a potential for, for novel combinations of genes to move from the gmo out into the wider environment through a um crossing event with material that with which it may be fertile that i guess is the the risk i would want to flag up but i have no background in calculating that or evaluating that kind of risk to to be able to sort of put it in a in a scenario for you um so i mean for for i know our q corporate position we are we are science-based um informed by research and we are neutral on decisions which are sort of highly politically charged and for which we do not have active research to to contribute to the debate and so i think that's probably where i will also stop if you allow me yes it um uh it reminds me of the possible ways in which viruses cross from animals to us and create havoc i suppose it's something akin to that um there is another way in which uh, I, I just sort of had a, a personal uh, involvement with uh, an acquaintance of mine in Britain who started uh, his own apple orchard using original uh, apples, the kinds that uh, you could have found commonly in the orchards uh, in the 1800s. And uh, he did this with great passion. Uh, but when it came time for him to try and market them, he met with very little success because the lovely, shiny, red, glowing apples that uh, people buy in the supermarkets 
put his apples to shame, although they were much tastier, uh, they didn't look that way. And as a result, uh, I, I saw him some years later, uh, he reported to me very sadly that he had to give up uh, this project and all the trees have been removed from his acreage. That's sad to hear. I, I'm suggesting that it's a failure of research and marketing rather than a failure of holding old apple varieties per se, because I'm sure there's a lot of enthusiasts that are very happy with their old varieties and have found a niche somewhere, even if it's just a curiosity to share with friends yeah. and relatives. I would so, hope that. Yeah. I, I wouldn't write them off. And it, we, although we're not an enormous agricultural producer or exporter uh, in the UK, we do have a, a serious interest in apples and we have a, a site where a lot of our traditional varieties are held um, for the public sector and for the private sector to, to access when they need material for breeding. Um, and that is in Kent and is a very fine site. And we don't want any of those varieties lost. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, Rick, I'm looking to get a specimen of Wolf River apple to grow on my property. You ever seen one? Three apples and you got a pie. Anyways, Catherine Swift. I, I was, uh, you've actually, Michael, partly answered my question already when you were responding to Jean Doherty's question. I was very interested in um, knowing just a wee bit more, because I'm sure it's complicated, but just how when things are coming in from all over the world, you make sure that you don't contaminate your collections. And I, you actually mentioned the word that you have to decontaminate them or whatever. But yeah, I would imagine with something that's a living organism, like a seed, um, you know, that, that, that you've got to be very careful about how you go about that process and yet you don't want any stray bugs in any part of your facility and when I say bugs I mean everything from the viral level on up to the fungal level probably but um, anyway I was just a little bit curious about how you mitigate that. Okay there's, there's a few tears in, in, in the, the way we respond to that risk and the at the heart of it, I think, is good laboratory practice. So the the Millennium Seed Bank is only two decades old, bespoke, constructed, designed for this purpose. Um, there's no surface on which anything can catch or rest for any great length of time without being wiped, um, vacuumed, and removed. And I, I found it difficult to move in front of the doorway of one of our dry rooms the other day and I looked down and I was stuck to a big adhesive mat and I hadn't seen the um the, the, the staff notice that I think was was going around that warned us to actually intentionally tread on this adhesive mat which has just been installed to prevent transfer of any debris pests um from our base of our shoes into one of our controlled rooms where um, we are licensed to hold higher risk material and so it's an example of just continual evolution um, in terms of hygiene good training good management um, so that's at the heart of it and then when we know there's higher risk material coming in because it's um, a relative of one of the european crops for example um, relatives of of potato or grape, anything like that, are, are, are significant risks to, to European agriculture. Um, those would be tr handled as quarantine collections and are only brought out when the, the, the room has been zoned for quarantine. All the staff wear um, outfits that are then um, sort of suits that are thrown away at the end of the that exercise on the quarantine material. And there's no no risk of transfer of whatever might be in that to another collection being worked on that doesn't have that status so um, we we then wrap up our quarantine work to be done on those higher risk days and it's scrupulously cleaned afterwards and then if we know that there's a particular outbreak or problem or pest that is spotted notice then of course we notify plant health and um, they are around to to advise us how to control it and the there have been a couple of discoveries where there was, I think, a virus in one of the wild potato seeds that 
um, actually became a, a mini research project and was was published. So kind of the whole the whole community learned from that. Um, but I'm not. Uh, I'm sure there's loads more we can apply as we learn more. We can put more controls in place because the, the field is continually to moving. Thank you. Now that was great. That really gave me a good sense. It's almost like, you know, we think about these things with the biosafety and the hazard suits when we're talking about, you know, animals or something, but you really have to apply a lot of the same things here. So that's super interesting. Thank you. And if I can just add, I think all of us, when we're moving from farms to natural areas, um, natural areas from one country to another, we've all got a responsibility to be cleaning our boots and our camping equipment meticulously um, so that we're not inadvertently contributing to any of these pests or diseases um, speeding across our, our, our nation. And so we, we take that very seriously and are, are looking forward to having our boots inspected on arrival in New Zealand or wherever for that for that reason because we will have put the time in and they will be immaculate okay well it's been a very interesting presentation michael and q a has uh, perked my interest more time to wrap up and i personally say thank you very much but the formal pres uh, thank you is about to happen thank you um michael i on behalf of KCOR, I it is indeed my pleasure and my privilege to be able to thank you for an absolutely wonderful presentation. For me personally, it brings back a lot of my memories for 30 years of work in a national collection and um, the work that you... Jeannie, you're muted absolutely essential and critical for worldwide planet safety. And I really, really thank you very much for the work that you're doing. It brings back a lot of memories for me and the details with which you were able to answer our questions was, was wonderful. So I would like to thank you again very much for this presentation. And for those of you who are online who have never been to any of our KCOR presentations before, I would strongly encourage you to go to our website, CanadianCore.com, and I'll look at the Stay Informed section. And from there, you will actually be able to get information about this particular presentation and how to link to it and see it again, if you wish. And all of the other presentations that we have had in the past are also available on our YouTube channel and you can access it through that link. Um, CanadianCore.com also is the place to go if you're interested in becoming a member of, of KCOR, the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome and all the work that we're doing. I appreciate um, anybody who wishes to look at that, they could they can go and see a membership form there. So again, thank you very much, Michael. It has been a pleasure. I look forward to um, the discussion afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>